Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're, we're going to get started, if that's okay, with this, uh, with this small group. Um, so, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Chris cruz Kalari. I'm the new Senior Director of the Academic Support and Access Center, um, and I'm here with Deborah DeMille Wagman, who's the Director of Disability and Academic Support. So, I, I guess I'll start by saying that, that I want to disclose and, and share with you that I wrote this proposal within weeks of my arrival at AU. Um, I came at the end of the summer, and um, I, when, when the call for proposals went out, I, I sort of thought, well, I hadn't had a chance to really work with, with faculty and staff at AU over uh, the areas where our, our, um, you know, our passions intersect, but I thought it would be an opportunity for me to at least get to know some people and, and let some colleagues know what what's, I've been working on prior to coming to AU and what it interests and excites me, and hopefully, um, get to know some people a little bit better and then build on that conversation uh, for the future. Uh, prior to coming to AU, I um, was in a lot of different roles, mostly related to student support. I was a, a director in previous positions, uh, a counselor. I taught for, uh, I guess, eight years. Um, and my entire career has been in disability services, academic support, and uh, providing programmatic support to students who are from traditionally underserved groups. So this position as Senior Director of Academic Support and Access really brings all that together. And uh, for me, universal design is, is a body of research that brings it all together. Um, because what I found is, is that um, what we're going to share today and, and discuss with you today, although it's rooted in, in the research that shows um, what can be most effective for students with disabilities in terms of teaching and learning styles, it can really be effective for all students. Um, so that's a little bit about me, and, and Deborah, I know you want to say hello as well. Hi. Um, I'm also new to my position, Jordan Higgins, uh, of November 4th, but I'm not new to AP Life. Um, had, this is my ninth year here. For eight years, I've worked as a counselor for graduate and adult students, so I, I have that background. This is also a second career for me. Um, I had you know, a career as a lawyer for 20 years. I went back to school in my 40s. Um, Prompted by, you know, my, my personal, I, I have a my older son who's now 23 and he openly discloses this, he's really severely dyslexic. And I became very interested, you know, personally, for like how you get information into someone who's clearly very bright, but can't take it in in the, in the traditional ways. And, you know, I would say fortunately for him, I soon realized my interest extended beyond just him. <laughs> and, and, you know, so I sort of bring a different perspective. I bring a perspective as, you know, having had a different career, but also, Having been a student, my, an older student myself, it was very different. I went to law school mm -hmm. straight out of college and then was a, went back in my late 40s, which was a very, very different experience. So. so if we could, especially because we're a small group, could I just ask each of you to introduce yourselves and like what you teach or what program you're attached to and, and what your interests are, and maybe we could start over there in the corner and kind of go around. Sure. Thank you. My name is Lonnie Martin. I'm an MFA uh, candidate at uh, School Communication and uh, some electronic media. And I fully intend to go into uh, academic world, or I hope to enter the academic world uh, upon completion. I'm Laura Gibson. I'm a third year PhD student in history. I hope to be teaching a general education course this summer. Uh, I'm Rick Stack. I teach in school communication. I point here, it's now. Been on the faculty for 20 plus years. Uh, I have a uh, son who has uh, attention deficit disorder. Um, I've had all kinds of interesting experiences in the classroom. The very first time I taught uh, as an adjunct, uh, early mid 80s, uh, one of the most unusual students I ever had um, was a blind student, uh, and I learned so much. Uh, from him, and I've had a few other experiences since then. But now I think the, the, the real issue that I'm struggling with, again, not just for my own child, uh, who's college age, uh, but I see attention deficit disorder sort of creeping in everywhere, and I'd like to be able to deal with it better. Okay. Great. Hi, I'm Marilyn Bell I'm a Wilson I'm primarily with faculty to do assistance in terms of teaching strategies. And then I teach in the School of Education. Um, this is something I've always been interested in and committed to, and I always want to have more information so that when I work with faculty, I can include this in um, helping them to be more aware of the diversity of many of the classrooms. Uh, my name is Dr. <coughs> Law. I teach at the School of International Service. 
relatively new, been here about two, three years. Um, I'm here because I, I want to, I've, I've had several students of um, with, with varying disabilities, um, and I I just want to challenge myself to, to serve them better. Be here. Right, so throughout our conversation today, and I really want it to be a conversation, um, we're going to be guided by a presentation, but please feel free to jump in and make a comment, ask a question, and we can certainly address those things as they come up. Um, we, we're really supposed to have a much larger group than this, but, but I guess on a Friday afternoon at the end of the day, some people decided to, to do some other things, but um, I guess one of the things I want to share with you that, um, again, thinking about this being a much larger group is just acknowledging that, that there was a, a consolidation over the course of the past year, disability services and academic, uh, the Academic Support Center combined and now it's the Academic Support and Access Center and then some new leadership came in so um, I'm the senior director, Deborah's the, the director of academic and disability support and like wherever I go and talk to faculty and staff I like to just sort of throw that in there because yeah. I think people are still asking questions about I it. I didn't know this happened. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm sharing with you our mission and and I think the thing I want to highlight there is that the ASAC uh, serves all AU students in lots of different areas of academic support, and I'll talk about those in a quick second. And it is the place students with disabilities uh, go to to receive their accommodations formally, their accommodations for disability. So um, that's, that's the new ASAC. And some of the things we, we provide there for students, so academic counseling, so students are meeting one-on-one -on -one with academic counselors. Um, we have programmatic support for diverse groups of students, so like right now we're looking at um, some of the institutional data and how we can create programs around um, academic skills that address where our students are succeeding at AU and maybe where they're struggling in terms of content and in terms of the various colleges and schools. Um, we provide instruction in time management and reading, note taking, exam prep, all that. We have a writing lab, so there's the writing center on campus, but there's also a writing lab within the ASAC. It really focuses more on, on the nuts and bolts and our uh, writing lab counselors, as we call them, are trained in specific strategies to work with students with, with disabilities and specific strategies related to students, uh, international students and students um, whose first language is not English. We have a supplemental instruction program, which is like small group instruction that's attached to classes that are known to be difficult. Uh, we have dedicated staff for our student athletes, so all the academic support for student athletes comes through our area. Um, international students, graduate students, and again, students with disabilities. And then um, Deborah and I feel really strongly about collaborating with faculty to enhance student success, so this is just one example of it, but um, we have lots of ideas in mind, and we would actually welcome any ideas you all have for how we could be more helpful to you going forward. So today's presentation is really about universal design and instruction. And um, I'm going to start off with providing a bit of a framework for universal design and um, some examples of it. I know for some people it's going to be a review, for other people it might be some new information. And then we're really going to focus on UDL as it relates to writing, so we're going to hone in on that. And then I'm hoping throughout um, that you'll hear the themes of, of diversity, inclusivity and excellence, and fostering student talent. So just a, a couple of comments about that. Um, you know, the demographics of AU are, are changing. Um, I came on as the demographics are changing really rapidly, um, so I don't have the same perspective as so many of you do. Um, but so many of our, our colleagues throughout the, the university are concerned about um, how we best meet the needs of students who are geographically different, socioeconomically different from what has been here maybe historically, um, and lots of other kinds of diversity and making sure that we're as inclusive as possible. So I think universal design really um, helps the university in, in thinking about those things in a very specific and concrete way. And I, I love this idea. Yeah. I just want to interject one thing. I don't know how, if, is this the first time you've ever encountered the term universal design? I'm sure many of you have not. Yeah. Yes. First time, really, yeah. as a former term. Yeah. yeah, because then, you know, the term came from originally as like from architectural. Like, you know, the universal oh, design yeah. came as right. removing barriers to architecture, like access ramps. Architectural yeah. access is yes. what it Yeah. Um, so, and this idea of like inclusivity and excellence, so like on one hand, you know, we're sharing strategies and having a discussion about how we can help more students succeed, um, but it's, it's when you think about universal design or when you look at the, the scholarship related to universal design, it's also about fostering student talent and potential. So we're providing greater access, but there's also an opportunity for students to learn at, at, with, with deeper levels of rigor, and, and I think that's a really important um, 
distinction there about this research. So I'm excited about it. So some of our, our references and resources ahead is the national organization that guides um, disability service providers in higher ed. So we're always looking to, um, you know, the, the information ahead shares with us. AAC and U has a, a diversity initiative called Inclusive Excellence, and it, it talks a lot about um, how universal design, again, helps operationalize and concretize this idea of providing greater access while maintaining excellence. And I really recommend the University of Washington's Do It initiative, which is a universal design resource used by people across the country. And uh, we're always talking with students um, with disabilities and without disabilities about what works for them. So a lot of that sort of permeates this. Uh, this conversation and this presentation. So, all right. So this is what Deborah was really um, starting to talk about, and and uh, I jumped the gun. No, that's <laughs> totally fine. And um, so some just some defining ideas here. So it really is rooted in in the broadest way in architecture and design principles, but it's been adapted to to be applicable to learning and instruction, and that's really what we're going to focus on today. But stepping back from that a moment, it's designed for maximum usability by all people to the greatest extent possible, um, mitigating the need sometimes for accommodations or adaptation or special design. So like the idea is if a building is designed accessibly and right in the first place, we don't need to like add a, a, uh, a lift to get a student who uses a wheelchair up to the, to the lobby level um, because it was designed right in the first place. So that, that's the idea there. So it's inclusive design and it, it takes into account human diversity including uh, functional limitations associated with disability. And you know, we're going to really focus on how in a college setting what's good for students with disabilities can be good for anyone. But again, stepping back from that, um, universal design as a paradigm what's good for, for people with disabilities can be good for all people. So one example that I think a lot of us use in our office applications is like the undo button. Like we accidentally like delete half of our PowerPoint presentation an hour before we're coming to, to something like this or any document. And as easy as just clicking on that one button, it's all back and like, you know, people I don't think get as nervous about that anymore. So that's an example of of universal design in action in, in most of our lives. And certainly, as, I, as I've been saying, all these ideas can be um, applied to learning. Okay. So this idea I'm really excited about. So this is this idea of, of our cognitive working space. And so if you think about cognitive working space as uh, you know, the amount of room at any given time that any of us have to learn optimally, and that can be constricted based on certain variables or that can be expanded based on uh, you know, the, the most accessible environment possible. So things that can constrict it are related to issues related to access. So if a student is, is coming to us not really prepared for some of the content. So academic preparedness issues certainly can constrict cognitive working space. Um, we know students' interest. You know, if students really interested in the topic, you know, he or she's open. And if, if you know, not so much interested, you know, the students may be just trying to get through. And that, that sort of approach is kind of, of students feeling like content is not related to them can certainly constrict cognitive working space. Um, things related to, to background knowledge in a general way, so that's the reference to schema. And then, of course, disability. When something's inaccessible, uh, if a student is has an audio processing disorder, which is a kind of learning disability, and he's not hearing um, the classroom conversation uh, correctly and, and sort of straining to do so, that's sort of shrinking his ability to learn um, optimally at any given time. And then the stress that all that elicits takes up even more space. So universal design tries to get at all those things for the largest group possible. And I'm really excited by that. And I always think about this on, on a day-to-day -day basis in my life. Like, you know, when am I like really constricted because of all the stresses of whatever, and when am I really at like my, my absolute best as a professional? Anyways, I think of it as like, for those of you who used Windows years ago, when you used to have a lot of windows open in Windows, it would like start to slow down, it would be, this is probably before many of you, but it was just the computer wouldn't operate efficiently because oh, yeah. too many windows were open. Yeah. And that's what, it, that's, that's what it's like in our brains when we've got all the stress going on and trying to create other, you know, working that. So. Yeah. So universal design, as, I, as I've said already, really, um, I think, intersects with, with diversity and providing as inclusive an environment as possible. Um, I, I, you know, the university aspires to be as inclusive as possible, and I think that, that some of the strategies we're going to share and hopefully some of the conversation, maybe some ideas that you have, will really help bring it to, to students' lives in a real way in the classroom. Um, 
I, I will mention that universal design is referred to by name in, in the Higher Education Opportunity Act. So I think that's exciting because I think like as, as time goes on, there'll be some funding attached to uh, you know, some of the work that we're trying to do and, and some, I think, increased opportunity for grants. Um, and I'm going to actually talk about a grant that I worked on in New York prior to coming at AU that informed a lot of what I'm going to share today. So let's really get to some of the principles. So the fir there are seven, so I'm, I'll go through them and we can stop and talk about them and, and as, as you want. So the first one is, is equity. So a principle of universal design is equity. So some attributes of that, um, that students are having the same or an equivalent experience, that it's appealing, that stigma is avoided, so that if a student, say, learns differently, that somehow the environment is not necessarily drawing attention to that. And a really easy example of that is a course website that's designed for full access, including students with print impairments. And when I say print impairments, I'm talking about students who are blind or visually impaired or students with learning disabilities. So that's, you know, when we're uploading documents to Blackboard, that those are accessible by a screen reader. So that's a, a real simple example of, of how that plays out in action. Uh, the next principle is flexibility. So attributes of that include choice, diversity, and adaptability. Um, so integrating various learning strategies. So, for example, when there's a reading assignment due at the next class session, maybe a faculty member would ask students to, to um, engage in a particular reading strategy in advance of that next class session. So create, you know, read this chapter and create 10 questions, uh, you know, related to the analysis of the content. And that helps on two levels. One, reading research shows that that can increase comprehension and active reading. And two, in the classroom, students who may be more reluctant to participate, maybe because of disability issues like um, a, a diagnosed anxiety disorder or something to that effect, um, will have something concrete that they could use to participate uh, maybe more seamlessly and feel comfortable and sort of lessen some of that anxiety. So when you think about like those classic college classroom settings where you know everyone read and there's all this like give and take discussion, and that's great and that can happen organically, but maybe asking students to come in having already created some questions can um, help those students for, for whom that could be a really scary experience. And again, it, it also can increase comprehension in, in, in its own right. Um, so looking at like projects, for example, maybe allowing students a choice of projects so the, the learning um, objectives could be the same, but maybe how a student demonstrates that could be different. And then, you know, just a couple of, of, of ideas about note taking. Two things I want to say about that. One is there's this rule that I've been encountering here and prior to coming here where some faculty members, and I get it, don't allow students to use any technology in the classroom because of how that can, can you know, be distracting and students aren't really engaged in the class. Um, but certainly there are a number of students with disabilities and even students without disabilities who are really soothed by taking notes on a laptop or a tablet or just engaging with it um, you know, on any level. And they're actually, uh, th their comprehension of what's going on in class is actually increased. They're actually more engaged, but, but they are sort of manipulating the technology. Now we've asked, we've talked through the issue with faculty and, and in most cases um, they've allowed students to use the technology, but it became an extra step. I don't have an answer, you know, during this presentation as to how to balance um, our students being distracted with technology and what might be good for a, a large number of other students. But it's something that, that I'm sharing with you to consider. I, I do have sort of a little bit of yeah. opinion on this, and, and some solutions I have seen is, um, you know, part of it is my sort of like, like hands-off approach, like, you know, taking, you know, students taking ownership over the seeing their education mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, recommended to some professors that, you know, partly I, I've always been them to have one, one student in the classroom who's using a computer is out of this having right. a disability, yeah. which, you know, it, it, they're entitled to the privacy being protected by the law. And yeah. you can't, and yet you, you know, it's hard, you, like, students do get distracted in classrooms. And if the class is large enough, having those students who choose to be on their laptops and not, you know, not, not on task, having them sit in the back row so they're not distracting other students is one very sort of practical solution. And as with any student, like, you, know, you can always respectfully ask them, like, you know, if you're not, if you would like to watch, look at Facebook, please do it outside this classroom. Mm -hmm. I, I do this in my class. Um, I have a class of 30. And the room will look something like, like this, but not all in one square, you know, two groups. Um, and I tell students on day one that there are only two things that will upset me. One is that they wait till the end of the semester to tell me that something didn't work. That's, that's not useful. And the other is that they use a laptop or a cell phone, you know, in the class for something other than taking notes. Um, for the same reason, because people don't want students to feel um, desperate. 
identified is also because more and more I'm finding students who have undiagnosed learning challenges. Mm -hmm. They yeah. end up in college. They come to me and say, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Everybody else spends half the time I do, and I can't get anything done. Now, I'm not a diagnostician, so even though I pretty much figure out what's going on, I just encourage them to come and talk to someone in your office. So I let them use computers, but I am like, like a she-bear. First of all, I walk around, and if I see a student who's ordering shoes or doing whatever, I will call them on it after class. But I've also noticed for Krista, and this is a new thing I'm dealing with, mm -hmm. I had one student this semester, and I'm, he does not have a, a, um, accommodations, but I will state my reputation. Because he sits at the computer and he's doing this. Okay, he's twirling his hair as he's sitting at the computer. And he hears every word I'm saying because every once in a while he will wave his hand and say something right on, you know. And I know he's not taking notes because he doesn't really type it. But he's clearly using the computer as a fidget of some kind. So I just deal with it individually. And other students don't complain that I once, one day when I thought students were using them publicly, I asked them all to turn them off. And the most two emailed me and said, I don't want you to think that I was doing anything other than taking notes. I really was. And I said, well, I apologize if I made you think I didn't, you know. So I just deal with it that way because otherwise you've got one student in the class who clearly has a learning challenge because they're doing the ones. Then you'll have a hard time convincing faculty. One, just building off of that, one of the things that's happening nationally is there are more and more students on the autism spectrum showing up in, in college classrooms. And one of the things I see here at AU is that um, we, we too are experiencing that. Some of our students are registered for services and accommodations through the ASAC, and some students are not. Um, the students and their families are choosing not to. That's, that's not our recommendation, and we have some, some of our own sort of ideas about how to pull more of those students in to, to get connected with us. Um, but this very thing among students on the spectrum is, is common, uh, that students need something in class to, to, yeah, to soothe. And, um, you know, it it's, can be easier when the student is connected to us so we can have a, an additional conversation with faculty, but faculty on their own are going to have to, mm -hmm. to really think about how this is going to be managed in the long term. Yeah. Slightly off topic, one of the best laptop and electronics policies I ever had with a professor was if I catch you using your laptop for something other than notes or playing with your phone under the chair, I will mark you as absent for the day. Mm -hmm which I thought was absolutely the most brilliant thing. Mm -hmm. And just on this, the nature of like undiagnosed disabilities, there will be people who have diagnosed disabilities like ADHD, but they don't, the level of impairment may not rise to the level of they, you know, what's under the law that, you know, that they need accommodation. But it doesn't mean that the, the diagnosis is still not there and they're not dealing with some of the behaviors. It's just in order to, you know, to receive accommodations, it has to create a sort of uh, you know, make impact a major life function. And they, have to, they may also yeah. have to be tested. A lot yeah. of students. I've, I've had, yeah. in the years I've been here, five students who were tested during college. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mostly after I took a psych course. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah. God, that's me! And then you have to think, of punch me again. Yeah. But you have to think, though, too, like, not, you know, yeah. that often, like, students who end up in college by their nature are very, very, you know, they're, they're quite competent and have been able to compensate. Yeah, and it's just yeah. they do what I call like, I've, I've worked with a lot of lawsuits. They sort of, they hit the wall and their compensating mechanisms don't work, don't work. and don't work anymore. They're not efficient. So one additional thing I want to say about note taking is that there are a number of students uh, with disabilities who are requesting note taking in their classes mm -hmm. and um, I think this, this is your dream Deborah that um, more faculty consider the idea as sort of a part of the classroom culture as part of the experience of a course mm -hmm. that students take turns taking leadership with regard to That's notes right. and posting them on Blackboard so that we don't have to <laughs> so that we, we don't have to necessarily assign a note taker to that class and, and again, let's face it, students without disabilities are going to probably benefit from comparing, you know, another student's notes to their own um, and, and, you know, sort of going from there. So um, that's another way to look so at this particular principle. anyone who wants to try this semester, does it please tell me about it? <laughs> but well, let me ask you a little bit about it. It's an intriguing idea. Um, you know, it's a school that has about 25. If you're asking for volunteers, um, I mean, you're, you're hoping that everybody takes a yeah. turn doing this. Yeah. 
But for those who don't want to, they're sort of, you know, self discriminating. They're saying, well, I, I can't do it, I don't want to do it, I. It, it's not just life. I mean, my, my, for me, I, the trade off for me is that the benefit that all get outweighs. Some people are going to go along for the free ride, maybe access to notes and not participate. You know, and the benefit, though, outweighs the potential harm or, or, or you know, and, and I think what you have to do is sort of create this culture where everyone sort of buys into it, that this is an expectation and that, that and it, and the, like, you know, like access ramps, people use them who don't have, you know, a physical a mobility issue and they, everyone sort of benefits by this being available. Okay, but, but for the student who really needs a note taker, mm -hmm. how are you going to deal with, with that student? Well, if, if every class had notes and that student had access to the same notes. And everyone would have access to those notes that were, say, posted on Blackboard. Like if it rotated among all the students. Right. Well, I understand together. that that yeah. person would benefit from everybody else's uh, leadership. But every student in that class would benefit because it would be available to every single student. But you're saying when, when it's that student's turn, he might not want to yeah. do it, and then he kind well, of... Yeah. He's yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're, you're shedding a spotlight on this person's disability. Well, they, I mean, there's ways of doing it so it can be done anonymously. I mean, I, I think we, we do this, we, we figured out ways within our office so that the, 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 the note-taker process now is all anonymous, and so that it's, the note-taker downloads them to Blackboard, and then the student retrieves them from Blackboard. Mm -hmm. So it could be done in such a way that publicly everybody doesn't know, you know, whether they sign up, you know, privately with the professor, and then they're assigned a certain date, so people don't, they're not, it's not said who's posting them. There's ways of working on it, and I'm sure it could be worked out. Yeah, I'll acknowledge though it's a layer of record keeping. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's another layer of record <laughs> <laughs> So another principle of universal design is this idea of intentional simplicity and that things are intuitive and a um, so a couple of attributes of that are removing unnecessary complexity and that, that students are, are graded and focusing on things consistent with what's important to faculty, so consistent with expectations. Um, and a way to, to get at this is, is through using rubrics for um, writing projects in, in particular. And I think a whole you know, um, conference session could be devoted to, to effectively using rubrics. And I would say, you know, it, for me anyway, I would defer to an individual faculty member and, and you know, his expertise in a particular content to really decide what's an effective rubric for that particular project and, and content area and, and what is it. Um, but I can tell you that students are often not clear as to um, really what they're going to be graded on. So um, is, this, is this, you know, essentially uh, reporting of information, summary of information, or is this a synthesis activity? And at what level is, is grammar really and, you, and proofreading taken into account? So um, rubrics can, can um, really provide some clear guidelines for students in terms of how they're going to be graded. Um, perceptibility. So um, this is, you know, as effective communication as is possible. So diverse modes of presentation. To, so that's, you know, lecture, small group stuff, um, showing a video. That's contrasting between important and subordinate points. So just the use of a PowerPoint in and of itself, because of the nature of the way PowerPoints are, um, you know, can be effective for a large number of students. Maximizing legibility. There we're talking about just paying attention to fonts. And, and you know using the, the cleanest ones possible um, and, and some further examples of, of this particular principle so using tactile cells in biology so students aren't just um, you know looking at a particular um, you know cell uh, composition but they can actually feel it and certainly students who are blind or visually impaired benefit from that and I've certainly been in situations where our office has had to collaborate with say the biology department to create some tactile models um, but certainly other students benefited in the process. And um, things as simple as using bullets and written explanation can really help flesh out some of the, the more important points. I want to make just two points that, uh, about this. You know, the first is we um, had a student this semester who um, had a, a disability that interfered with her ability to sort of read graphs and charts. And she was taking a math class in uh, the calculus, and calculus, where you, where you, and I'm not a math person at all, I never took calculus, where you chart the, the signs what is it? Sign and cosine. Sign and cosine, yes. And literally, you know, someone in our office prepared like these 3D, like, with, like using those wiki wax things, so oh. that she could actually feel how the graph worked. And, and she she used those for all of, of, of the tactile. She, and then she got it. And, and I also think one of my favorite things is um, when I was in law school, taking civil procedure is a very important course, but it is one of the driest courses there, there 
is. And when it's taught, it's sort of like learning how to play Monopoly. It's very much about rules and how you litigate. And it, it is like learning how to play Monopoly without a board in front of you, is how I like it. And there's a professor, uh, Louis Cross, who's at the law school now, who teaches civil procedure. And what he does, he's, he, there's a film about this very complex, um, was I think I believe it was about environmental superfund that is being cleaned up. It's a very complex case being litigated so that he follows it all through along with the textbook. Like this is what, you know, this is what, how a lawsuit begins, you know, following in the movie and, and teaching it then about this establishing jurisdiction, you know, over the subject and the matter and the people. And then this is how discovery process goes and you're actually watching it happen because most of the litigation is not done in the courtroom, it's done outside the courtroom. Actually very few cases go to trial. And this one did go to trial and you're talking about, like, you know, how you produce witnesses and call witnesses and evidence. And it really made it, Come to, you know, I, I was wishing, I, I love civil procedure, and I'd like to, only after I got to law school, I actually used it. And I think, you know, the students I've talked to have taken it this way, really understand it in a way that they would not have just reading about it. So. Cool. So um, another principle is a structure for minimizing error. So the idea that error is expected, like students are going to make mistakes on this really important project. And, and we want to minimize those ha uh, hazards. And we want to sort of think about, we want to consider like, well, um, wh you know, what are my goals here? So I know for myself, like I do my best, most refined work when I have the structure and space to do it. So that includes sometimes, say, in, in this context, you know, Deborah, read this with me and, and give me some comments and, and, and it you know goes from there and my, my sort of work becomes more refined and, and more exact and um, you know I'm learning in the process and I'm, and I'm creating a better product. So sort of applying that same principle to any project in any course where the, the act of revision becomes a, a part of the learning goal in and of itself. And, and so the, the clear example is just opportunities to revise, to revise projects. Yeah, after feedback especially. Yeah. Um, and then reduced physical effort. So um, that plays out not even in just in terms of, of you know, physical space, but also in terms of um, our videos captioned for students who um, maybe have an audio processing disorder or a, read, uh, a hearing disability. Um, text that is screen reader accessible, I've used that already, but again, that, that, that not only for students who are blind or visually impaired, but for students who have a learning disability related to reading, just aren't good readers but are superstars in other areas, um, being able to, to hear text in, in an audio fashion can, can make a big difference. Um, we're really interested in, in uh, so many of the courses and programs that are taking our students off campus and, and sort of being able to talk through with students um, some of the, the barriers that they might experience so we can either um, you know, just lessen anxiety or that, so that we can actually address some real accommodation needs related to the physical environment. Yeah. Most things, this is the good news, most things, um, but it's an error people make really quite often, most things are screen reader accessible. So any Word document, an, the updated version of PowerPoint, all screen reader accessible. Um, what very often happens in, in Blackboard, but I have to say it's happening less, is that instead of uploading um, an accessible text to, to Blackboard, faculty are updating like an image of a text, which at, at face value is not screen reader accessible. So then we have to go. So it's like. Like a JPEG or a GIF. Yeah. 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 So like. PDF doesn't work well? A PDF can, but, but and, and there are some rules to it. Um, PDF in, used to use what's used Articles. Yeah. You can't turn that into a Word document. Well, you, you can, but, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's complicated. And some PDFs are accessible, some PDFs are not accessible. Okay. Um, so if you know how to, if you can sort of run the scan on a PDF to ensure it's accessible, then use a PDF. If not, if possible, um, then you use, like, say, you know, an uneditable Word document, for example. Um, we can certainly consult on that, and some of it does come down to case by case. Is this accessible or is this not accessible? Um, but an image is really like a picture of words versus, you know, well, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so students can't can't get to it. So it's like taking a like almost like taking a picture of you know a document created in Microsoft Word and uploading that versus the actual document that's in Word. Um, that that's a, a, an easy distinction. And most like like Macs all have like you know text to voice software on them already. Most of them the newer ones. 
And there's also programs you can download for free, like, what is it, um, Read Naturally? It's a free download that you can then use it to, to read with, with a document. There's very sophisticated programs that are quite expensive, like Kurzweil, which well, sort of the catalog of the yeah, software yeah. for that, yeah. Oh, wait, so, so if a student, if a student in our class had accommodations, and it's set on the accommodations that they need, um, a screen reader or whatever. Or alternate would, format of text, is usually the one. Alternate, alternate format of text. Okay, would they explain that to us? They should. Yeah. Okay, because I've never had a student tell me that. Well, well, partly because what they do is, like, they, you're not, they would, that, if that's that. one of their accommodations, we have an assistive technology person in our office. So they probably have worked out getting like copies of like, like electronic version of the textbook or you know so a, they've done yeah, that yeah. Okay. that happens behind the scenes. Okay. Which is but I'll tell you but in a, put in a big plug for it, that you know, putting your textbooks up early, you know, for it's it's so important because it, the accessibility issues uh, you know often have to sort of be figured out in advance. Yeah. Right. And if we don't have enough notice, it's really hard to end up like chopping and scanning books or, or whatever and it's Having them up early is one thing you can do and make life so much easier for us. Um, and then uh, a, a final universal design principle, so appropriate size and space, so the most inclusive spatial context. Uh, so often, like a student with, with a physical disability um, may be subordinated because of the arrangement of the room, so paying attention to issues like that. Um, so like, you know, a student who's a wheelchair user or a student who uses crutches, he's, you know, just at a funny angle in comparison to the faculty member or his peers. Um, you know, a lot of us have seen things like this in, in auditoriums, but it happens in the classroom. But in auditoriums, it's like, you know, the, the space for uh, wheelchair users is like in the back or off to the side, and, and they're just, you know, not really a part of the group in, in the most optimal way, and their experience is affected by it. And this happens in the classroom setting um, as well. So just paying attention to how the room's arranged and, and you know, our students really um, as, as you know, equitably placed as possible, I, I think is just something to keep in mind. Science lab stations, I'm putting in a plug for that because we have, a, you know, we have uh, Hearst and we have inaccessible labs over there and, and we have to change rooms a lot. I think a lot of this is going to, to be changing over the next, say, five years with, with AU's um, sort of new construction plans and that's actually a part of it. Um, but, you know, this kind of thing, uh, you know, certainly is, is making, you know, many of our students feel, uh, it's adding another layer of management for a lot of our students. Yeah. Yeah. So, more benefits. Um, universal design can create a more co inclusive college environment for everyone. Um, so, students with disabilities, students from traditionally underserved groups, students who are coming with uneven levels of preparedness, certainly all could be, um, you know, some of our best students, but, um, you know, infusing some of these strategies could really get at some of our students' strengths and, and help mitigate some of their um, some of their areas where, that they're still struggling with. It certainly mitigates the needs for some disability accommodations, some not all. So universal design is not going to take away the need for our office, is not going to take away um, the need for students to register for services, but it's going to help. Um, the next two bullets are really exciting to me and, and because I have an interest in, in sort of the history of disability and, and how that's, that's sort of played out in American society and disability is often associated um, with, with deficit and what's exciting about universal design is it, it's now associated with something that, that can help everyone. It's something that's associated with, with um, a dynamic way of looking at life. And um, I'm just really excited about that. And, and I always put kind of plug in at this point, like, you know, at least for like, you know, learning disabilities, I like to think of them as being like, indicating neurodiversity, which is, you know, as opposed to being like, you know, a disability or a difference, it's a, just a diversity in neuro. And, um, you know, this idea of, of talent cultivated, disability or not, preparedness issues or not, um, I, I think, and, and, and the, the scholarship supports this, research supports this, that if we're creating a context for students to do their best work, we're getting at some of the accessibility issues, we're getting at some of the issues related to uneven academic preparedness, but we're also providing a structure for people to do really good work. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's really exciting to me. So we're going to focus on, on the writing portion of our, of our uh, presentation today and, and transition to that. Um, and that comes from 
points of intersection of a lot of different research. So universal design itself, developmental writing, disability studies, literacy education, which is intersections of you know reading, writing, listening, speaking, and all that. Um, psychoed research and, and deaf education. And then I really hone in on, for me, um, these three areas. So that's research related to, to teaching and learning strategies that are good for students who are deaf and hard of hearing, students with learning disabilities, and then this idea of, of literacy development. And I guess the, the first thing I want to say in terms of like really understanding um, some of these issues is that a student who at face value, like say has a, a reading-based learning disability, if we can create a playing field that's even for that student, he's not necessarily a poor reader. So, so the issue, so his comprehension issues are not necessarily fixed. We just have to have the accommodation in place to help him really access whatever comprehension levels he's he's capable of. So, so disability in itself does, even though it sort of like plays out like, okay, this student's not a good reader. That's really not the reality of the situation if he were in, starting in a level playing field. Um, this idea of the compromised holistic literacy dynamics. So research shows that you know, we all become better readers and, and better writers, listeners, speakers, etc. through reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So, so when one of those things is, is compromised for any reason, so let's say uh, you're a student with a hearing impairment or a student with a learning disability related to audio processing, that part of the, the literacy dynamic is compromised and then that could be bringing everything else down. So that helps to explain why say some of our students who are deaf and hard of hearing are also struggling many times with reading and writing. Um, and then just I'm very excited by the whole idea that, that the, teaching and the teaching strategies that we choose to use and the learning strategies that we help students feel comfortable with can really mitigate all of this. Um, so I'm going to share with you this, this uh, collaborative project I worked on with faculty at the City University of New York where I came. So we had a two-year grant um, where we identified the most effective, um, based on our experiences and then in consultation with the research, the most effective uh, kinds of writing strategies that, that professors can use to really help students produce their best their best written work. And we, we started with you know, meetings with, with students, with faculty and our tutors to really just talk through you know, what are the issues that, that are presenting, you know, where are our students um, not doing so well in terms of their writing at all levels. So not just in the, in the you know, comp one and two classes, but even as they get ready to graduate and they're engaging in capstones. And, and what are the issues there related to writing? Um, we, we, we did our research, so the grants allowed us some, some uh, resources to conduct research, and we did that um, in lots of different ways. One of the ways we did that is through collaboration with the education department and had graduate students really take the lead in some of that. Um, and then, you know, fa based on all that, faculty decided to implement some strategies that they found, and I'm going to share some of those with you in a minute. We had roundtable sharing, so we would come together, uh, mostly faculty, but also academic support people. Sometimes students would come together and sort of talk through, you know, some of these strategies, how they worked, how they didn't work. We honed in on some of the best ones and ultimately created a guide that we used for uh, faculty orientation, um, uh, whether it was new faculty, continuing faculty, um, a lot of, of uh, professional development for our, our adjuncts, for our part-time folks, um, to provide strategies for, for them to infuse in their, their coursework and their classes right away. And then we, we sort of assess things like semester by semester, you know, what were the things that were most successful, what things um, you know, were, were not as effective, and, and, and why. So I'm going to share the, the five plus one um, writing strategies that, uh, that, that professors have said that, that can be the most helpful. And some of them are really simple, and, and you can start using those on Monday in your courses. So the first consideration is just providing both written and verbal instruction. I mean, this is a very simple one, but um, this can get at various learning styles. But simply, not only you know having the assignment posted to Blackboard, for example, or you know handed out in hard copy, but also just reading it through with students. Mm -hmm. And I know that but when really, and, and when, you, when creating assignments, I, I'm a, such a firm believer in people understanding why they're doing what they're doing yeah. and <coughs> purpose. I, you know, I think purpose drives so many things in just in life in general. But and I and I start not just with the students, but. Um, with the professors as well. You know, why are you having the student doing what you're asking them to do? What are you asking them to demonstrate they know or understand? And I, also, I end up having discussions often with professors about, you know, like sometimes negotiating accommodations. And one of the things I sort of try to elicit from them is like, what are the essential elements of what you're teaching? And what are ancillary to that? And so 
I mean, you really think about it as what you're teaching as opposed to all these other things you kind of tack onto that really are, may not be relevant to what you really want to teach them. And, you know, for example, like if I think about it, my son when he took anatomy in college, he, you know, his dyslexia, he could not remember the names of anything. And yet he, you know, he did an cadaver lab. He could look at that body and tell the professor every single thing that, that, that it did. And if he saw a list of those words, he could identify what the word was, but he could not be able to recall it himself. And I was able, you know, to help him persuade the professor to let him test in an alternate way for that. And he, he knew that any more than anyone else in that class. But he could, what, what was showing, what the professor was testing prior to him adapting it, was was showing his disability, his, his inability to sort of generate, you know, symbols for words on his own. And so that to me is a really, you know, an important sort of way of thinking about things. Asking students to paraphrase um, an assignment, a writing prompt, whatever the case may be, and the related instructions as a class activity. So, so maybe after you know the first consideration is is implemented, asking students to complete like a, a learning log kind of activity where they sort of put in their own words um, their understanding of, of the assignment. I mean, it's it's sort of like a five minute thing. Yeah. Faculty can collect it. It's not necessarily graded, but really get a sense of you know. Um, does this individual student or does my class in a general way really understand um, what, I'm, what I'm asking them to do? And the students appreciate it because they, you know, they're feeling like, okay, like, you know, me doing well is really important to this professor. All of us doing well is, and, and helps contribute to that, to that culture that we're, we're referencing here. Did you say you would make this available to us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so a third consideration, and, and this goes back to rubrics, letting students know from the beginning how their work will be graded and consider the use of rubrics. So, so where's the value that I as the, the professor am placing? Um, you know, the, the rubric can lay it all out. Um, I would also even suggest as an activity, so say you, you've decided to use a rubric and, and you know, students are in possession of it, um, so maybe as, as part of the revision process, students are required on a particular date to bring their draft to class. It must be complete and students partner up with someone to, to um, you know, provide each other feedback but using the rubric. So they're also getting practice in, in reading a rubric. That's the other thing. So just giving the student a rubric, you know, many times they're not used to getting them and don't really know how to use them and uh, for, at first pass they're not that successful. But actually pulling that into um, sort of a longer process um, can be really can be really helpful to students. I had another point on this, which is I think it's really important to give context to students um, to where you sort of stand what I would call sort of surface errors, and those people who are writing writers may disagree with me, but they're uh, like grammar, punctuation, and you know sort of choice of words, because uh, while those are very important to writing, um, they are they, they are they are in some ways the surface. So I, the, you know one can argue that they also help make it clearer. But what's, what's, what, where when anyone begins to write, you begin to write with the ideas. And some people have a disability that interferes with the ability with the surface sort of presenting those. The ideas are there, but it's, it, they need help with getting those ideas out. Yeah, and then that's what, that's what, you know, the work sometimes that we do in the writing lab is like, you know, helping clean up the surface part of that. So, but what, and the reason I raise this is I think it's people, everyone has very, you know, most instructors and professors have different tolerances for service areas. And, and at least, and so it varies from person to person and letting people know upfront what those tolerances are. So, um, showing models of finished assignments early in the process. So can inspire students, can inspire lots of thinking, and, and certainly provide a framework for, uh, for what's expected and what the, the faculty member considers a, a, a good piece of, of written work. And there is, you know, as you know, great variation um, very often from, from time to time. And, I, and on this one, I think about my own personal experience when I went back to school in my 40s. And, you know, I had written, I've done tons of writing in my life, and I've written legal briefs, I've written memoranda, you know, I've written you know, sections of textbooks. And, and, the, and then the very first assignment I had, you know, I was struggling. I wanted a model, you know, and fortunately in the, in the department they had examples of, you know, some of what they wanted. Like, you know, somebody had done exemplary work on this. And, and I didn't mind, and, I, and it really helped me. Because I saw what they were talking about. So I was sort of lost. And I, and I come at this with a lot of education. And so I, I really think that a lot of people, almost everyone benefits from really what I call direct and explicit instruction. And modeling is one way of doing that. And saving the examples of prior work that you thought was really good and just letting the students look at those. The fifth consideration is breaking projects like research papers into smaller parts 
and providing you know assessment and feedback along the way. I mean, so many of this stuff I think um, faculty members are already doing, and there's a lot of overlap here. Um, but this is a universal design strategy um, that that the research shows, particularly for students with with learning disabilities, can can really make a huge difference. And you're going to be a secondary effect of teaching planning skills that people are going to take out into the real world as well. And then the plus one, so, so is related to reading. And it really goes back to this idea of the you know, holistic literacy dynamic that I'm really interested in. But um, always considering reading strategies as, you know, for reading assignments because enhanced reading comprehension can affect the quality of writing, particularly when, uh, well, almost always, but certainly like when students are responding to, to specific text and those kinds of, of courses. So um, you know, really thinking about asking students to do some things other than come prepared having read something, but come prepared with this particular um, activity completed um, can, can not only be the basis for a really rich classroom discussion and one that's structured that can help you know, all learners uh, participate because they've prepared and it sort of mitigates the anxiety, um, but also increases comprehension and then in turn that can increase the quality of, of the written work. And, and the faculty that I worked with prior really advocated for making this sort of a part of our, of our ultimate campaign. So it's like five plus one, you know, simple considerations for, for improving the quality of student writing. And one, and one of the things I always do with students is really encourage them also as they are reading to think about when they read something, what was it they hated about it in terms of how it was presented, you know, writing-wise, versus when they read something they really liked, why did they like it? Like, what was it about it that made it easy to understand? So it's not just when they're actually writing, but that thinking about other people's writing, how other people are communicating is really important. One of the strategies, one of the most effective strategies that I've felt as a student is, like, all the readings that are assigned for the week. You know, the day before class, we were asked to like kind of paraphrase it into like say a 500 word note. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, so that you know what did you like about it, what did you take away from it. You know, just put it down in words, yep. and that helped retain that reading yep. so much more. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the semester, when you came back to revise, all you had to do was like read your own notes. You know, <laughs> of those 500. You know, so it was nine weeks or ten weeks of reading, and each reading, each class was like five five readings. Yep. But you know, yeah. it was not supposed to be like one reading summary. It was just like synthesize it, yeah. so it's around a yeah. topic, and then you, it kind of retains. You retain that much more about that topic or such, as okay. opposed to a reading. And one of the things that's occurring to me as you're saying that is, is that activity can be graded or not graded. So I'm really sensitive to to you know faculty's workload, to our workload, to you know everyone's workload, and and you know so sometimes like when we talk about some of these ideal scenarios for universal design, it becomes like another layer of of management. Something like that is really, you know, you, you could decide that you're going to at least check that students did it or not, but it could just become sort of a part of the, the way the class operates. Yeah, it was 25% yeah. of our grades, uh -huh. so you know, there was an incentive for you to do it as well. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen and it in it different really ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we were writing up our final research papers, our idea was like, mm -hmm. go back to Sounds my notes. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what's happening to a lot of students, like, particularly with undergraduates, they're coming in developmentally they're finding that it used to be when it, most of them were younger it's easier to cram things into your brain and just remember them and as you get older you know there's two, yeah. two, two, two different things that happen it's like you, you, adults tend to learn things by relating them to things they already know and also that you have to sort of interact with the material and think about it not just you know I always think about it in Latin it's like you know, you can tell two different words for knowledge one is when you factually know something and one, one is when you comprehend it and um, one is one the basis for science, root for science, and I can't remember what the other one is, but it will come back to me. But, and so that what you're trying to get is like students to comprehend actually what they know, what, they, what they're reading, and not, just, not to just like hear it, you know, and lose it. So just, I mean, some final thoughts here. Um, you know, s encouraging students to think about how they learn best, um, the use of strategies, um, asking students to, to, to really think about, you know, what's, what's their plan to complete this assignment. Um, and as Deborah has said, uh, to encourage students to think about the purpose of what they're doing at all times and to help students to, to, to model that in some respects. Um, because in many cases, students have never been asked to think critically about the assignments they're doing or their own learning, um, although they might be really good students. Um, but in some ways, they're doing it um, as very capable students in a very passive way. And, and so really helping students uh, you know, think through some of these things. And you know, just some final takeaways. So again, what's good for students with disabilities can be good for everyone. Um, and, and this whole idea of, of 
you know, my hope anyway, that, that we can enrich relationships between our area and faculty over some common causes. And, and that's, you know, really one of my big hopes for, for today. So uh, we're open to your ideas. Um, we're going to be working with CTRL over the next year. And, um, you know, please stay tuned for any communications from the ASAC. And feel free, any of you, to write us at any time to just talk through an issue, to meet. We're really open to that. And faculty are already doing that, and we're relatively new in our, in our roles. So um, we're excited about those opportunities. And, and, you know, we have our contact information here. So... Um, so that's, that's, you know, all the, the formal stuff we're sharing, but we'd love to hear from all of you about anything that resonated or questions or experiences you've had. Yeah. Has, has there been any research on UDL in reference to students, not necessarily disabilities, but English as a second language accessibility mm -hmm. in the level of their, their learning in a language that is not their native language mm -hmm. and how this sort of speaks to that? Yeah. Or does it speak to it, it does. There's a huge overlap. Um, there's a huge overlap. In, in, in fact, um, if you sort of, you know, look at the body of research w with regard to, you know, strategies successful for students with disabilities, teaching strategies, and look at the body of research about strategies uh, for students whose first language is not English or being taught in a language other than their native language, whatever that may be, um, there's huge overlap, huge overlap. Um, you know, and in fact, you know, this is an aside, but, but it's related that so many times sort of figuring out like with college students, um, as Marilyn was saying, like, you know, who may have not been diagnosed at any point in the past, um, but are sort of experiencing some issues. If it's also a student who's a non-native speaker, it can be a real process figuring out, well, what's the issue here? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the answer is yes, huge overlap, huge overlap in, on so many levels. In fact, it's, you know, it, it actually what happens in the brain um, that the student has a reading disability, which it actually the, the part of the brain that normally turns symbols into fluent language doesn't function. And so as the person is decoding the words, so like, like if anyone's ever learned a new language, it, it, there's a point at which you can actually translate, but you're not actually comprehending. And, and because so much effort is going into the translation and the yeah. rambling part, that you lose a comprehension. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very similar parallels. Yeah. Yeah. Is there also oh. some kind of uh, distinction between reading and writing abilities, not so much writing, but reading abilities for returning students, especially those who have been out of school for a very long time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so like it might be like someone who's coming from a master's a grad program to a master's and a master's to a PhD is already in the groove and takes that much less time to kind of process right. dense mm -hmm. matter, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. someone who's coming back after like say five years or mm -hmm. ten years, yeah. there might be a difference in the way they just, yeah. you know, just getting into the act of reading, for reading, yeah. can be challenging. Yeah. I think that's something that you know, tutors can kind of take into consideration, that it is taking them a while to kind of get yeah, up right. to speed. Right. And that's the beauty of some of these strategies. So, so, you know, started out talking about what can work for a student with a disability, but in fact, um, it can help the student you just described. And many times when we're talking about graduate students, you know, some of our most dynamic graduate students are, are sometimes the ones who, who you know, were out of school for, for five years and who are bringing all this like real world perspective but are out of sort of practice with some of the academic I stuff. I'm coming yeah. back after 10, yeah. 11 years and yeah. I find it like, you know, mm -hmm. I went back after 20 years and it, <laughs> and it was really interesting. It reminds me of like, also date myself, Dr. Spock's baby book. I, I realized I knew more than I thought I did and it, 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 the, the benefit is like you know you, you, some things are harder for you, but you also bring other skills into it that yeah. make it yeah. easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know how to manage your life. You're, you know, you're not worried about whether you're going to get asked out on a date on Friday night. At least I was. <laughs> and it, it was you know there's other. It was just there was more sort of manageability to my life, and the skills I used in to manage my own life could also be used in my academics. Yeah. Yeah. Something else that I think would be uh, helpful here that would provide um, uh, hope and confidence to both the teacher and the learner. Uh, is to understand the flip side. Uh, you were talking before about uh, kind of a, thinking of these uh, conditions as a, as a deficit. Mm -hmm. But I know working with family members who have potential deficit disorder, uh, there is a plus side that really needs to be nurtured and, yeah. and re-emphasized and reinforced. And sometimes people with that situation can be the most creative mm -hmm. folks in the room. Right. Um, so I, I think it would be helpful uh, for all of the various situations that we might encounter to understand what we could expect on a downside, mm -hmm. but what is the potential on the upside, and you know help us uh, maximize the upside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
who might might have interest based on who went off to college, he wrote his college essay. He has extraordinary 3D visual skills. Mm -hmm. and, he, and his essay was about the time with my younger son with, a, with ADHD who jammed a lock and virtually broke it. And my, my older son took the lock apart piece by piece. It was just hundreds of these little metal pieces and cleaned it and put it back together. Mm -hmm. And that's what he wrote his like you know college essay about. And like that that's that is a real skill to be able to do that and the visual memory that it took. And that that is definitely an, an asset. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just I'm you know and I'm really compelled by your comment on a personal note because I you know a lot of my work has been in advocacy. I mean that's really what what drives me. And um, you know Deborah and I were talking about this earlier. So many of our students who who you know end up as you know, in, in some of the most selective programs or whatever the case may be, you know, they, they, they many times are, are sort of fitting a traditional mold of what, what we've always thought was a good student. And, <coughs> and I think by thinking things through the way you're suggesting here, we're sort of opening the door for, you know, possibly even greater talent in some cases, but at least equal talent that may just look a little different on the surface. Yeah. Take pride in this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Something I've, been starting for, sorry, sorry, oh, something I've been struggling with um, and experimenting with is moving away from writing as the primary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm an SIS is a heavy, heavy writing school, mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to SOC, which can be more visual, naturally. Um, Different divisions, but yeah, a lot of writing. Yeah, yeah still a lot of writing. Still a lot of writing. Still still writing. 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 And, <laughs> and I've been experimenting with, like, how do I get you to communicate what you know in something that's not writing? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and and, um, and 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 giving them options of just different creative options that I still think hit the target learning objective. Like yeah. Well, it may learning. it may be like you know, let them do a YouTube video. I, mean, yeah. I think about you know, I, I worked with a student who an undergrad who had a severe reading disability, and she was struggling with that, and then she had to do something for a class that was make a video about deforestation. She had the, like the time of her life, and she clearly knew a lot about it. All this stuff in there, and it was just it was her element. Yeah, and, the media. And she was so excited about it, and. And she learned everything she was supposed to learn and demonstrated that it was just like a different medium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I think the, the starting point is to just create the awareness that, you know, there are a lot of people with these kind of issues and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, like everywhere in all the brochures or, you know, school handbooks or etc., there'll be the syllabus, there'll be the objectives, etc. And by the way, if you have disabilities, you can... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go here. Yeah. That should come up front, somewhere yeah. in between, you know, instead of being an addendum to, oh, by the way, if you have difficulties, you know, the thing is that. There's a template that we created last year, and there's a page of resources for students of any year, and it has all the resources listed and all the links. I think the office needs it updated now. Yeah. Good. I need to do it. I did it personally, but I think you never remember what you did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Kind of I mean, because, like, back from where I come in India, I mean, half the people and professors don't know what dyslexia is. Yeah. And they'll just look at a paper and say, oh, you've got all your spellings wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, so it starts with awareness that there is something like this. And I think part of it is also realizing that like, so many of us, like, we, we view things, uh, like, we tend to go towards what we're comfortable towards and, like, the way that we work and, you know, you remember that 50 percent of learners are auditory and that, you know, there's other kinesthetic learners and, and it's just thinking that just because you do something one way doesn't mean everyone is going to do it that way. Thinking outside of your own experience mm -hmm. or the way that you yourself were taught. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Um, when, when students come to meet with you, obviously students who have the learning differences or challenges identified early usually benefit from some therapy. You know, and, and are very good at advocating for themselves. But I found that students who um, maybe didn't have that can't always explain what it is they need. Yeah. Especially when they need the hard the biggest challenge for me has been I've had a few students like this. Students who really couldn't synthesize the information. That was probably the biggest challenge. I had a student one semester who really, really could not put the pieces together. And we figured out a way to do it. It was very labor intensive. Like we do it for one student, I think we've done it for more than that. Um, but she didn't know, she couldn't really articulate what it was that she needed. Yes. So do you, when the students come to talk to you, is that part of That's part of the yeah, definitely when I counseling, when we, we see students like you know, we, we said, you know 
one-on-one -on -one would be, like, you know, sort of what challenges are you facing? You know, and then sort of breaking it down, doing talk about it. and talk about it. You know, I, I go through sort of what I call task analysis. Yeah. Like, what do you have to be able to do to do what you're being asked to do, and where right. are you having the problem right. with it? Right. And then where, you know, if, if one of those elements can be alternative than accommodation, or is it an essential element of the class that you know how to do this? And then try to come up with different strategies for the student to approach doing it, yeah. or if necessary, is accommodation, you know, trying to figure out accommodation will help with that. Yeah, well, I won't tell the story because I had one student last semester who was willing to advocate so well that she went over the line. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I couldn't really explain. I, I didn't know how to have the conversation with her. She, she'd gotten so good at it that she passed the point of being assertive. And she was into the, <laughs> into the obnoxious. <laughs> she, was just, she was making demands that were just as, and I couldn't talk to her about it. Because she didn't, she, didn't know, she didn't realize what she was doing. Yeah. And also, yeah. And perhaps yeah. like in the support systems and like for the counseling and etc. I mean, unless you're really, you know, kind of bombing a course, to tell a student that it's okay that you know if one professor gives you an A and the other one gives you a B, mm -hmm. it is not a reflection of you, but it's also a reflection of the professor's biases because every professor comes with their own bias mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of writing styles, at least. Mm -hmm. You know, like some of them want it a particular way, and if you don't write it this way. Mm -hmm. Well, some will, you know, encourage more expression of your own style of writing. Mm -hmm. But then, then there are these straight jacketed. So you have to, like, prepare students that you can't always please yes. all professors. Sure. Sure. And they have to be what's called otherwise qualified. They have to be able to do whatever the essential elements of the class. It's not you get a free ride because you have a disability. And yeah. Yeah. Students with disabilities fail courses because they don't know the material. Right. Just like any other student. Yeah. They have that right to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And, and that conversation that Deborah was talking about a couple of minutes ago about helping students to be able to talk about mm -hmm. their, their needs more, mm -hmm. part of that conversation, depending on the student, the conversation could be, you know, how to pull it back and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and you know, speak appropriately to your professor and your program directors and all that stuff. So, so all those conversations are happening if, if you know, we have the relationship. That How's that working for you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a huge learning experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a social kind of how to self out. Yeah. And some students do it very effectively. They know what they need. They have some elevator speech about how to explain certain things. Mm -hmm. It's very, and you can tell them the students who've been identified for are often the ones who do that extremely well. The ones who identify, who self identify, or found out later in their teen years or college that they had a learning challenge. And I would say one, one thing is also I would really encourage, you know, thinking about universal design and instruction and don't accommodate without a letter from us, please. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. part of the But if you're doing universal design, then you accommodate. Yeah, it's, it's built into it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I so I think we have to. Yeah. You mentioned some of the organizations. We want to get more information about UDL and other stuff on the web, or like we, you know, if we want to see some of the academic things that are written about it. Yeah, there's some things on our website. It's not as robust as, as we would like it to be, so I would say start there. If um, if you'd like me to direct you, like I could direct you myself to some things if you um, if you just emailed me and I'm you know just see Cruise at American and. Um, you know, the, the Do It initiative at Washington State, you could just type that right into yeah. Google and that'll come up. Um, so, so you know, please email me, but, but in the meantime, there's our website, there's Do It, um, and, and uh, you know, that'll even, that Googling will lead you to some other things, so, yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone, and I appreciated it, and uh, I look forward to talking more with everyone. Thank you. Thank you.